running for office during a global coronavirus pandemic and the Iowa primary election is only two weeks away. Where do Democrats running for the U.S. Senate and the right to take on Republican Joni Ernst stand on the issues? We gather four candidates here at Iowa PBS for this special live Iowa Press debate. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Live from the Iowa PBS studios in Johnston, Iowa, this is a special U.S. Senate Democratic primary debate. Here is moderator David Yepsen. In 2020, Iowans had barely transitioned away from the presidential caucus season before a global pandemic changed the daily life across the country. But election year realities and the gears of democracy still churned forward with the June 2nd primary only weeks away. Joining us tonight for a live debate at Iowa PBS studios are the four candidates seeking their party's Democratic nomination for the U.S. Senate. We're hosting this debate with increased public health precautions with a minimal staff joining us inside this empty 300-person auditorium at Iowa PBS studios. There is no audience on site tonight and candidates are separated by more than six feet with plexiglass barriers between them. Now to introduce those candidates. Kimberly Graham is an Indianola-based attorney and advocate for children and families. Eddie Morrow is a Des Moines businessman and former coach and teacher. Mike Franken of Sioux City is a former U.S. Navy Vice Admiral. And Teresa Greenfield of Des Moines has worked in urban planning and as a real estate and development executive. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. And joining us in tonight's debate, questioning, is Kay Henderson, News Director for Radio Iowa. I would like to open the questioning with an ele a question about electability. And we'll just go down the line. I'll start with you, uh, Kimberly Graham. Why are you the most electable Democrat in this race? Why are you the Democrat who can beat Joni Ernst? Well, there are several reasons. I think that first we need to look at how somebody has campaigned so far. Um, it is absolutely uh, possible that uh, a more progressive Democrat can win a statewide race in Iowa. I have a couple words to say about that. Tom Harkin, he once won all except one county in this state. And Tom Harkin went everywhere and listened to everyone, even and especially those with whom he disagreed. And that is how you win. I've been an advocate and attorney for abused kids and for parents in juvenile court for the last 20 years. And I've also been a family law mediator. If you want to get good at actively listening to people, become a mediator because that is the number one skill. And I believe that Iowans are going to give any candidate a chance that they believe is doing this for the right reasons, that is there for them, and that is going to always put people over profits. Mike Franklin? Why are you the Democrat best suited to beat Joni Ernst? Well, thank you. Um, so I'm born and bred Iowa, rural Iowa, a youngest in a big family, small town. Little did I realize that that, that opening to life, uh, hardworking, disciplined, educated lifestyle would do me well in almost four decades in the military and, and almost a decade as an admiral. Uh, that, in turn, that worldwide perspective in legislative experience and executive experience, interagency, broad understanding of Washington, D.C., and also maintaining Iowa core values throughout it all, and understanding where Iowa core values connects with good governance. Consequently, I believe I have the tools necessary to defeat Joni Ernst. Teresa Greenfield. 
Why are you the best Democrat in this race? Well, thank you, David. Yeah, I'm Teresa Greenfield, and I'm a businesswoman, a business leader. I am a mother of four, and I'm a really proud farm kid. And I'm running to put Iowa first, and I'm not taking one dime of corporate PAC donations. And I think it's important for Iowans to know that. You know, on the farm where I grew up, my dad always said there's no boy jobs and there's no girl jobs. There's just jobs that need to get done. And I think Washington's the same way. We need to get some work done on behalf of Iowans and all Americans. And I'll tell you what, um, Joni Ernst, she disappoints me. She puts her corporate PAC donors first, and I think that hurts Iowans. You know, I'm running for hardworking families. I carry their fight in my heart. You see, um, I was widowed at the age of 24, and my first husband was a lineman for the power company, so he was a union member, IBEW. And when he died, I became a young widow, uh, a single mom with a 13-month-old and another one on the way. And it was Social Security, hard-earned union benefits, and family and friends that gave me that hand up to get on my way. And so when Senator Ernst talks about cutting Social Security, I got in this race. And Eddie Murrow, why are you the most electable Democrat? Because well, I'm campaign? the Democrat best suited because Iowans deserve a senator ready to lead this health and economic recovery and address our shared challenges with the, the courage, the compassion, the urgency, and the uh, progressive vision that we need in this moment in time. I'm a lifelong Iowan, a, a proud father and husband, a former teacher that built a progressive business that provides paid family leave uh, that has 65% of our leadership being women. And when times were tough during the last Great Recession, I took a pay cut, didn't lay off a single worker. Others in this race can't say the same, especially Joni Ernst. I'm bringing progressive values supporting uh, uh, health care for every American and a woman's right to choose, making sure we're protecting Social Security and not accepting corporate PAC money. And when I'm elected, I'll treat the climate crisis like the national security uh, issue it is and support a Green New Deal. I'm here because Iowans need to have a voice. I'm asking for their vote because tomorrow we'll build a better America for everyone. Thank you. Kay Henderson. Mr. Franken, this question will go to you first. Thank you. Last week, the U.S. House passed a $3 trillion economic stimulus package with the support of Iowa Congressman Dave Loebsack, a Democrat from Iowa City, but Abby Finkenauer, a Democrat from Dubuque, and Cindy Axney, a Democrat from West Des Moines, voted against it. Which of those Democrats made the right choice? I believe the Congresswomen did. Um, there were issues with that bill. Certainly there's a high level of urgency to provide relief for uh, the, the COVID. Um, but there, we need to be more shepherding of our national resources. And I believe there were aspects of that bill which placated the uber rich, which we've had a, we've had a history of doing in such bills. And I believe we ought to get something from those bills that lead to a better tomorrow, such as a broad infrastructure package, or addressing the medical care, or addressing those most impacted by this, down to the small businesses and the workers, including those who are undocumented in society. What provision did you find most objectionable about the Uber rich? There was a, a passage, 1,800 pages, so, so uh, permit me a little bit of allegiance here and, or allow, allow, allowance off the script, but uh, there was an aspect of it which, uh, um, which promoted a tax break associated with um, uh, some previous uh, I mean, aspects. I mean, I, I don't know the aspects, but it, but it is, uh, I found it offensive. Kimberly Graham, would you have voted for that bill if you had been in the U.S. House? I know you're running for the Senate, but did uh, Congressman Loebsack make the right decision? Well, that's a good question. Um, actually, we, um, we had already court recorded a different debate, and during that debate, I actually said that I'm not sure that I would have voted for it because if, and this is the big operative word here, if it was basically a dressed up additional giveaway to already wealthy corporations that do not need those funds, then perhaps I would have voted against it. However, as um, Mike Franken just said, it's about 1,800 pages long, and here's what you learn when you deal with laws for a living. The devil is always in the details. And so not having read those 1,800 pages, first I can tell you that any legislation I will ever vote on, I will do the hard work, and I will read every sentence and every line. So I don't know exactly what's in it. I have not read all 1,800 pages yet. Teresa Greenfield. What is your judgment in terms of that bill? Should it pass the U.S. Senate as is? 
But we have to take action, urgent action, and I am glad that Congress and the Senate has taken action on the previous CARES bills, but there's so much more to do, and I certainly haven't had a chance to read 1,800 pages of that bill either, but I'd want to make sure that it really focused on the folks and the small businesses that are being injured as part of the COVID pandemic, and of course, this economic crisis, focusing on hard-working families that are struggling right now to make ends meet and pay the bills. And so I'd want to take a, a, another hard look at that. And because when I was asked, I hadn't had a chance to do that, I said I wouldn't be ready to vote on it. So you, you have no position. You couldn't say I'd vote yay or nay. Which, what we're trying to get at here is what, which other Iowa Democrats would you agree with? Well, I think that, you know, I want to be able to see what's in the bill, uh, what little I have learned about it. I was concerned about the transparency in it, the follow up, making sure those dollars go to those small businesses, because I think that our federal government has fumbled that football a little bit there in the previous CARES Act, and the dollars haven't gone to all the small businesses. And I want to be assured that what's in that bill will help Iowans first before I'd be ready to vote for it. So if I had to vote today, it'd be a no. Eddie Morrow, how would you vote? You know, first of all, in order to address the, this COVID pandemic, we need to talk about leadership. We need to have leadership uh, that, that wants to make sure that they're working for the uh, family farmer first, for the worker, for the unemployed, for a small business owner. And I've demonstrated that leadership for a long time. I run a small business. I pr provide pay family leave. And when we're having a crisis, I take a pay cut so that they can make sure we keep them all employed. In the midst of this crisis, I'm doing the same thing. My job is to lead catastrophes, fires, hurricanes, floods. I'm doing that today. And so Joni how Ernst. Voted I, on the bill? I'm going to get that because Joni Ernst right now and Donald Trump are, are, are not leading in that way. I got to tell you that I'm, I'm concerned about leadership within this race right here. So did Nancy Pelosi show leadership by putting that bill forward and would you have voted for it? Well, I appreciate a chance. If I got just finish really quick, I just want I wanted to make a point on the leadership. Now I'm going to answer your question because I think we're. we're yes, please, is, please do. Yes or no. Would you vote for or against that? I bill? think the bill needs to be stronger. And I'll tell you three reasons why, because I have read the bill. I think it's missing uh, um, uh, automatic triggers that are in for UBI and automatic uh, unemployment insurance. I think right now it's asking um, uh, to put COBRA payments in there, and I think we need to be expanding um, the uh, health care exchanges so that we can uh, save money and, and ensure more people provide health care to more people. So it's not strong enough right now. If I'm a United States senator, I would make it stronger and then send it back over to the House. Okay. Uh, next question also about the pandemic, and this will first go to Teresa Greenfield. As, as Iowans know livestock producers are losing money on the cattle they're raising. Some hog farmers are having to euthanize their pigs. Consumers are seeing higher meat prices in the grocery store. As a U.S. Senator, how would you, as a policymaker, balance um, the needs of livestock producers, the meatpacking industry, the employees inside the meatpacking plants, and consumers? Thanks, Kay. Well, absolutely. COVID-19 is probably going to be one of the most consequential events of my lifetime, and it has disrupted our lives, our health, our jobs, our education system, travel, and certainly our supply chain. And, you know, I grew up outside of a little small town where we work together to solve problems. And we have to work more like that in Washington, particularly when it comes to solving not only the health crisis, but the economic crisis. So it starts with making sure that we're protecting workers and that they are safe and can be on the job. Um, it makes sure that we are investing in the small businesses who need help to get through this crisis. And there's some of that uh, support payments have been going on. But when it also comes to our livestock producers, we've got to invest investigate the big corporations that um, have been fixing some of those prices. We have to make sure that our livestock owners um, are getting a fair deal. I uh, had the opportunity to talk to uh, a beef producer down in Warren County, and they're very concerned uh, about being taken advantage of by these large corporations during this pandemic. Mr. Morrow, how do you deal with uh, price fixing in the, the beef market, and how do you balance uh, the rights of workers in meatpacking plants and the meatpacking plant owners. So again, I'm going to go back to telling the first thing we need to do is address the leadership issue that we have. We got, we got a crisis leadership that's going on with Donald Trump and Joni Ernst. And until we address the leadership aspect and send the right senator to the United States uh, Senate that's going to lead, then we can't address those things in a meaningful way. And again, I'm out here t uh, telling people that we got people on the stage that are lacking that leadership. Um, and that's, that's an important contrast that we need to have a conversation about. Uh, on and, this stage, you have people who lack leadership? Yeah, so there's, there, you know, Teresa Greenfield, for example, has run a couple of businesses through crises, and both times she has chosen the wrong route, uh, laid workers off. Mr. Morrow, the question was about 
the meat industry. Could you focus your answer on how we deal with that? Right. Well, again, we deal with it because we have the right kind of leadership. In order to deal with that, you've got to have somebody that cares about workers first. It's going to care about the family farmer first, not big ag, not big corporation, which is going on with the leadership we have now. And that's why I think leadership is a very important element of what's happening. So right now we're being told to open up these plants and put people in harm's way. That's wrong. We've got to take care of the worker first. We're not, we're not thinking about the family farmer either. We're only thinking about big ag and big corporations. We've got to talk about how we overhaul our, our agricultural system and have a farm bill that meets the needs of the family farmer first. Uh, Teresa Greenfield, he mentioned you. How do you respond? You know, what I'm doing right now in this pandemic is focusing on the workers. I put out two plans on how to deal with uh, COVID-19, and it starts with making sure our workers are healthy and safety, safe. Essential workers need essential protections, and we can do that. I would ask the governor to ask the administration to use the Defense Production Act to ramp up uh, testing and PPE so that everyone can go to work, whether you're working in the grocery store, whether you're in the delivery truck, whether you're delivering the mail, or whether you're working in a meatpacking plant. Mike Franken, you uh, grew up in an area of the state where pork producers are taking hogs to plants in Dakota City yep. and in South Dakota, which have had outbreaks. How do you balance um, the protection of workers sure. against those pork producers who are facing the very real prospect of of having to euthanize their animals? Well, ma'am, um, so I worked in a hog kill plant for multiple years. So initially, things needed to be implemented. The owners of these plants needed to run them like they own them, and the employees are essential elements of their ownership. So slow the line, PPE, OSHA standards need to be reinforced, and, and not, not guidelines, but enforcement. Uh, a number of other things. But this comes at a very inopportune time for Iowa agriculture, as you know. We are facing not the 1980s, but something worse for Iowa agriculture. There are very few lines of effort in agriculture today that are profitable. Compounded by the supply disruptions that this processing now has entailed, both on the beef and the pork side, we have problems. And we're gonna see supply disruptions of an essential food element in, in society today. So something broader from uh, agriculture, big ag, to something that is more resilient needs to occur. And uh, the worker is job number one. We need to change our focus. Kim Kim Graham. <laughs> Thanks. So you asked how you balance you know, those interests and I'll be very clear with my answer. Initially, you don't balance them. In other words, you have to put the worker first. There is no burger, I don't care how good it tastes, that is worth anyone's life. So first, you initially need to shut down every one of those plants where there are massive outbreaks. You need to get testing done of every single worker who was in that plant, probably not just once, but down the road several times. You need to get PPE in there. You need to also ultimately uh, reconfigure the plant probably to keep people further apart, sterilize everything, sanitize everything, and then you can safely reopen. But in, initially there is no balancing. You have to put people first. Um, and then also eventually you need to hold owners accountable. Um, you know, these owners of these plants um, knew what we all knew for a very long time. You know, the way this spread, that it spreads in close contact, and yet they still had people right up next to each other with no PPE in some cases, no breaks to wash their hands, et cetera. That is unconscionable, and the owners need to be held accountable. I don't see that that happens hardly ever, if ever. And then down the road, you invest in inspectors, and you make sure that you have on-the-ground inspectors going in and making sure that all of these measures are in place that need to be in place. You know, as uh, Mr. Morrill points out, there's a lot of criticism uh, flying about this campaign of each one of you. And I want to get go to a, turn to a, a segment here in our conversation about the, some of the negatives that have been raised about each one of you and give you a chance to respond. So I'll start with you, Teresa Greenfield. The criticism of you is that you're a tool of Chuck Schumer and then as establishment Democrats who have endorsed you and given you their blessing. Now, who are... How do you respond to that notion that a bunch of out-of-state Democratic leaders are trying to foist you onto the Iowa Democratic Party? Thanks, Dave. You know, getting in a United States Senate race is a serious decision, and I spent months preparing to get into this race, uh, called county chairs, party leaders, activist friends, people I trust to really make that decision. 
And on the day I announced last June, um, I you know, decided to focus on building the strongest grassroots team. And it wasn't but a day or two later, 19 leaders from across the state, elected leaders, endorsed my campaign. And from there, we have just kept building a strong, strong team. So today, we just recently announced our 24th union that has endorsed our campaign, representing uh, Together, I think about 70,000 workers across the state. Uh, two weeks ago, the Iowa AFL-CIO endorsed our campaign. And look, we've had 15,000 contributions from Iowans in all 99 county. I stay focused on building a strong grassroots team here to win here for Iowa's because I'm putting Iowa first. Okay. Mike Franken, the term that's used for you is the negative carpetbagger that you spent your career outside of of your home area in Iowa and you've come home just to run for the U.S. Senate. How do you respond? Well, the optimum word was I came home. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So I'm a fourth generation Iowan uh, and indeed I spent my first 23 years here, the formative years, doing the assortment of jobs as you would expect in rural Iowa. But then I joined the Navy uh, and uh, I didn't know I was going to stay so long, but uh, almost four decades, uh, a great career. No apologies. And every job I've ever served in, I was with Iowans. And anybody who knows me knows exactly where I'm from. So I was privileged, exceedingly privileged, to have the spouse that permit, permitted me to do this race, and also the physicality and the verve and the effort that I would put my life aside to make sure I won. Joni Ernst ran on three qualities. So in, to ensure you have a candidate that wins, you need to negate those out of the gate. Rural, the pig thing, which is unfortunate, and military. I do those, Trump by a long shot, shot. And ultimately, I, with my legislative experience, I lay bare her voting record. And that is her biggest weakness. That's but, why I came in this race, to win it. Mr. Morrow, the criticism made of you is, first of all, you're from Des Moines. The track record of Des Moines-based candidates in statewide races for Democrats is not good. And secondly, that you're something of a perennial candidate. You've run for other things before, and, and people really shouldn't take you seriously. So how do you respond to those charges? Um, well, first of all, I want to commend uh, Michael Franken for his great service to this country. He's been really good. Um, but the fact of the matter is when he retired, he told an Iowa newspaper that he's going to make his home in Virginia. And he bought a million dollar house and has that house in Virginia. And that, that, that's, a, that's a problem for us that we need to talk about. He should be running for the United States Senate in, in Virginia because he'd be a great senator and a, a great uh, a well, great How about talking about yourself? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. So, you know, I've learned a lot from, uh, from my opportunities and my experiences in, in, in running for office. And one of the things I learned was that the D.C. establishment does like to weigh in these races. I learned that in 2018. Um, when they uh, chose Teresa Greenfield and pushed Cindy Axney off to the side. And I saw what that, what that does to people. In fact, Iowans don't have a choice right now in this race because they're trying to tell us that, that Teresa's the only choice and, and, and you don't have a say in that. And we need to reject that. And I learned from that that we need to go do something to, to, to combat that and beat that back. And what we've done is build out the broadest coalition and the best, best infrastructure, build the um, uh, uh, 92 counties before we move to this kind of campaigning, 100 virtual campaigns. And now there's a poll that shows I'm tied with Joni Ernst. And that's better than the D.C. establishment candidate. So I've learned an awful lot from those experiences. I'm going to take them to the United States Senate. I'm the strongest candidate in this moment of time to take her on in November. Mr. Hey, Franken, he took a, a, a uh, shot at you. Yes, uh, yes, how indeed. How do you respond to that? So, uh, yes, just to correct the record, um, when I was on a combat uh, deployment, 13-month deployment, uh, I was alerted that uh, Barack Obama, the President of the United States, selected me to be the Chief of Legislative Affairs for the Department of the Navy. I consequently needed to move my family from Tampa, Florida, uh, to Washington, D.C., this is what's done in the Navy. For 28 moves, I've moved. Four continents, 28 moves. So indeed, and the, and the, what you would do is you would buy a house. So that's the house. It was 2012 when I purchased that house, just to correct the record. Thank you. Okay. Kimberly Graham, you at the onset of this evening said you are a progressive. Others who are concerned about your candidacy use two words and they say you're too liberal. How do you convince Iowa Democrats that they should select you in a year when they're selecting a more centrist candidate to lead the ticket in Joe Biden? 
Right. Well, I think we need to remember um, who, with a little controversy, arguably, I understand, who won Iowa. And you could argue that that was Senator Bernie Sanders. So I think that says a lot about where a lot of Iowans think this country needs to go with our policies. Um, the only neutral poll done in this race so far by the Des Moines Register in early March had our campaign coming out on top uh, for both name recognition and favorability. I think that says a lot about the traction that our campaign has been able to gain over the little over a year now that I've been traveling all over the state. We got to 85 counties out of the 99. We did the rest online. So we've, we've been to all 99 counties, either in person or virtually now. Again, I would say we need to remember that Iowa has a very lengthy history of electing progressive or progressive for their time, at least, candidates, Berkeley Bedell, Tom Harkin. And let's not forget the self-described skinny kid with the funny name and the big ears who came here in 2007, campaigned all around this state on universal single payer health care, I will also remind everybody, and was elected twice by this state. So he won twice, Barack Obama did. I think that it's... It's just ridiculous to say that somebody is too liberal for Iowa. Actually, that's what the Republican Party is calling me, too liberal for, I for but, Iowa. But Ms. Graham, you have not run for office before, have you? No, none and of us Tom have Harkin elected office Tom got there on before. his second go to Congress. Berkeley Bedell got there on his second go to Congress. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama served in the Illinois Senate. Mm -hmm. He served uh, in the legislature there. Yeah. You've, not run, you've not run for office before. No, none of us have held elected office before, and I think uh, two of us haven't run before, so that's not unusual for this particular slate of candidates. I believe that we actually need more of us, regular working people, to be representing us. And so when we get that, we will stop getting this nonsense of voting for tax breaks for wealthy corporations that don't need them, and we will start investing in regular people. And until or unless we get regular people like me, a single mom with massive student loan debt, who has been representing people mostly in poverty in Iowa for 20 years and standing up and fighting for them, we will not see a change ultimately for our country. Okay, I want to switch to policy issues, and I want to talk about trade. I'll start with uh, you, Mr. Morrow. What do you do about China? How do we conduct a trade policy that keeps the Chinese from stealing uh, our secrets? And how do we deal with the tariff question that uh, President Trump has put on the national agenda? We'll start with the tariff question first because it was ill-advised and it's cost uh, rural Iowans uh, dearly. And uh, throw on top of the COVID pandemic, now we've doubled down on, on how, how farmers are struggling and how our, our communities are struggling today. Um, overall, with what we need to be doing with trade is, is trying to instill um, uh, the, the stealing of, of intellectual theft, enforcing those regulations, using our diplomatic efforts, not tariffs, not trade wars, because that's really harming, harming farmers in Iowa, harming Iowans, harming other people in, in, in other industries that have been impacted by that. We want to make sure that we do press China. But we also need to stop misleading people. There's been a deceptive uh, conversation going on that, that, that we need to have equal trade. And that's not just that's, that's just not accurate. There's nothing wrong with having a trade imbalance. We've been benefiting from that trade imbalance for a very long time. And Donald Trump has been trying to use that to create this division between China and the United States. Yes, do we have work to do with our trade uh, imbalance with, with China? Do we have to do some work on the intellectual theft that's going on? Absolutely. But we shouldn't be doing it on the backs of farmers, which we've been doing up to this time. And Joni Ernst hasn't said a word about it. Kimberly Graham, trade. Yes, well, you mentioned also trade secrets and stealing, right. theft, and that kind of thing. Um, we, one of the investments that I don't think that we're making at the level we need to is in cybersecurity. You know, we've had a lot of um, problems with that, and I think we need to be really focusing on a lot more than we have been. Um, regarding the tariffs and the trade wars, again, this just takes us right back to this current administration that continues to put profits over people and or centers their ego, the, the ego of the person in the White House, um, over what is good for working people people. We also need to start consulting regular people that will be affected by policy before we implement it. And I don't see that happening enough in this country. We make these decisions up here, and those decisions should be made in consultation with those that it is going to affect the most, and they should have the most input. Mr. Frank, trade. To answer your question specifically, you don't do trade policy individually. The way you do this, and I've written and signed numerous international agreements, is you develop a consortium of like-minded entities, countries, corporations, as it may be, and then you go together as a block. And you know where your trade space is, you know where China's trade space is, and you find an accommodation. And you're tough, 
and you use experts. This is where this administration falls. They're neither tough nor are they experts by a long shot. And they do trade by tweet. Absolutely wrong. And consequently, from agriculture to intellectual property to cyber theft and a whole broad list of items, this administration has ostracized us from our partners and has gone it alone. And consequently, we will fail with China. And Teresa Greenfield. Thank you. You know, strong international relations are good for peace, and they're good for prosperity, and they're good for Iowans' pocketbooks. And I'll tell you, as someone who grew up during the farm crisis, uh, was a, my family struggled with a Russian grain embargo. I watched tractors roll into Washington, D.C. Our farmers are struggling again, and I take it pretty personal. I went to auctions where families lost everything, and it was sold off from the hay rack, and they left our communities. As I've traveled the state and talked to farmers in O'Brien County and Fayette County and Floyd County and Guthrie County, they want their markets back. Between haphazard trade, uh, ethanol waivers, net farm income is down 75% since 2013. Bankruptcy rates are at an eight-year high. Joni, Joni Ernst, she's no friend to our farmers. And we need to elect a senator that will be a friend to farmers, our main streets, our small manufacturers, because we're a state of small towns and small businesses. Okay. This will first go to Kimberly Graham. Uh, Iowa's ethanol industry is hurting. What, if anything, should federal policymakers do to support the industry? Well, for starters, federally, federal policymakers, and namely Senator Ernst, should not be just kind of looking the other way and singing tra-la-la while these waivers go in place for these giant corporations that, that those waivers were never intended uh, to, to work for. Those waivers are supposed to be for very small refineries that actually need them. And again, this is a perfect example of this administration just doing whatever's going to benefit the already wealthy corporations. So I would be standing up and fighting for policies that would, in the short term, um, get rid of those, those waivers, and make sure that um, the ethanol industry has what it needs to keep employing the tens of thousands of people that it employs in Iowa with good jobs. Eddie Morrow, there is a proposal in Congress that would give ethanol producers a per gallon um, incentive right now to sort of supplement their um, income in the, in the wake of these huge profit, uh, losses in profits. Um, would you support that kind of move? Um, I would ask that it goes further because it's, it's not deep enough. It's not strong enough. So we need to do more with that. Um, and there's no doubt about it. But we've got to talk about overall, again, uh, if we're going to talk about waivers and the ethanol industry. We've got to talk about campaign finance as well because campaign finance money is getting in the way of Joni Ernst and others, keeping them from really standing up for farmers. That fossil fuel money is a big problem. And without her really standing up uh, strong for, for Iowa farmers, um, then they're going to continue to be left behind. And again, campaign finance money in this race, primary, is also a problem. So we have candidates that are taking fossil fuel money, tens of thousands of dollars worth of fossil fuel money. And that's a problem. It's going to be hard for them to stand up for those family farmers instead of, uh, instead of the oil industry as well. And who are you accusing of that? Well, that would be uh, Ms. Greenfield, who's telling us that she doesn't take corporate PAC money, but that leadership PAC money that she gets is full of pharmaceutical money, of, of, of fossil fuel money, of big ag money, um, and all kinds of money. And, and her and Joni Ernst both get to hide behind um, right. that kind of dark money. Uh, Ms. Greenfield, do you want to reply to what Mr. Morrow just said? I think it's important for Iowans to know that um, I've taken a pledge not to accept one dime of corporate PAC donations, and I'm thrilled to do it. I've been endorsed by End Citizens United, and I'll tell you, one of the jobs that needs to get done is to end political corruption. It is the very first plan that I put out because of all the things we're going to talk about tonight, none of it's going to get done until we end dark money in politics. And Senator Joni Ernst, she voted for a fossil fuel lobbyist to head the EPA who promptly issued those 85 ethanol waivers that have devastated our market. They need a senator that won't take one dime of corporate PAC donations, and I'm ready to be their next senator. Can we go back to Kay's question? <laughs> what was uh, Kay's question? Uh, well, um, do you, you've all talked about the waivers, except we have yet to hear from um, Mr. Franken. Do you support the per gallon um, package that would be going to ethanol and biofuel producers? I do. Um, Mr. Franken, what should policymakers do? Should there be a difference between um, the plants that are owned by farmers and the plants that are owned by corporations? So the corporate farm, it depends what corporate you're speaking of. Big oil, that's a separate matter. 
corporate associated with fa with farming industry, I don't believe so. I, d I don't know the specifics exactly, but I would segregate those two under the broad category of corporate. But the RFX, RFS exemptions are a killer. And uh, the Trump administration, frankly, EPA, is breaking the law. Um, this, was, this is existential for our farmers and our corn growers in America. And ultimately, uh, this is one more death knell to agriculture that Joni Ernst is not helping at all. Uh, Mr. Franken, we'll go on to another issue. Uh, and I'll, I'd like to hear from each one of you quickly about this. There are some proposals that different groups have made about the Supreme Court. Do you believe the size of the Supreme Court should be expanded? Well, I believe it ought to be depoliticized. And that's um, one idea that people have for trying to do that. Right. Um, I've not studied that. Uh, I, it, I, I would leave this to the constitutional lawyers to come forward with a... Uh, with an estimation on, on what, the, what the puts and takes are associated with this. I'm not really, you know, the, 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 the goodness of a person who's been in executive management for 25 years is when I don't know, I say so and I look for fair, guidance. Uh, fair enough. Teresa Greenfield, should the size of the court be expanded? You know, we need a fair and impartial Supreme Court. And certainly as a United States Senator, it's a solemn duty to advise and consent. But I don't believe we need to expand the Supreme Court. Okay. Eddie Morrow, yes or no? Do we need a Supreme Court expansion? So if it's going to continue to be politicized like it is right now, if we're, if we're going to be uh, appointing judges and, and awarding judges based on political ideology, then absolutely, yes, we need to expand the court. And Kimberly Graham, expand the size of the court? Uh, I would agree that that's one really good option for for trying to end the po the politicization of it. And you know, after watching um, Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, I can tell you that uh, if an Iowa judge, you know, because I've worked with Iowa judges for 20 years, if an Iowa judge behaved that way during an interview for becoming a judge, that person would never have been confirmed or or um, hired to become a judge in Iowa. I'm glad to say. Okay. Another lightning round. This one on a subject that was uh, debated on the presidential campaign trail. I'll start with you, Eddie Morrow. Um, should the federal government guarantee free college? They guarantee, no, but they should uh, guarantee debt-free college. Teresa Greenfield? You know, I'm, pro I'm the product of some progressive leaders who invested in college education, and I went to Iowa Lakes Community College, and the cost was such that I got a job at Pizza Hut, and I was able to buy my books, pay my rent, pay my tuition, and get a beer on Friday night. I would focus on trade schools, community colleges, make sure they're debt-free, and support our apprenticeship programs where people can earn while they learn. Mike Franken? Yeah, I paid for my college through working at a hog kill plant and as a, as a blacksmith, in essence. I believe that the wage scales are no longer applicable, that we can do that. We've got a problem. Uh, but ultimately, a voluntary expanded national service program as, a, as an assistance, very similar to the GI Bill, other matters, and, and, and no-cost loans for college students where, where the, the federal government isn't making money on loans, which is ridiculous. So there's a few measures we should do, but I don't think it ought to be a no-cost, no. Um, although we should work for uh, junior colleges and trade schools, yes. Kimberly Graham? Yes, I believe that trade schools and public colleges should be at no out-of-pocket cost. How we get there exactly, whether we expand Pell Grants, whatever we need to do to make sure that nobody leaves college or trade school with debt is what we need to do. We've got to make those investments. Let's switch to health care, Mr. Franken. Medicare for all or public option? I'm a, I'm a proponent, and having spoken to the drafters of the Affordable Care Act, I'm, I'm a proponent of fixing what's wrong with the Affordable Care Act and then putting Medicare option on that and ultimately bracing up Medicare. Uh, and there's a number of other measures that we ought to do. The end state ought to be what I received in for many decades, from seaman to admiral, from cradle to grave for every American, preventive health care, dental, uh, uh, mental, and, and physical health care for every American. And it ought to be even our even our even our um, our one B and 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 uh, two B workers. We ought to make this a birthright of Americans and for the working class in America. Teresa Greenfield, this has been a big fault line in the Democratic Party. Where do you come down on this question of giving everybody 
uh, Medicare or just expanding public options and existing? Thanks, Dave. You know, health, I believe health care is a right, and I want all Iowans to have health care. And I'll tell you, I kicked off uh, one of my Heartland tour at the Boone County Hospital and got a chance to visit with them about the community they serve, their patients' needs, and of course, understand a little bit more about the business of uh, the hospital and, and found out, of course, that Medicaid expansion has been a lifeline for our rural hospitals in this country. Look, I support expanding and strengthening and enhancing the Affordable Care Act. We have all the tools we need there. We need to add in a public option on top of that. So absolutely every Iowan, every American can get health care. And then finally, Iowans are being gouged by pharmaceutical companies on prescription drug prices. We need to make sure that Medicare is negotiating to bring those costs down. Eddie Morrow. So I believe in health care for every American. Uh, it's a human right. Right now, 73 million Americans do not have health insurance. Millions of Americans have insurance but can't afford the deductibles to get the care they need. And as a result, 45,000 Americans die every year because they don't have access to quality care. So how do you get there? That, that's not acceptable. Well, Medicare you get there by, all, by, by providing health care for every American. If, if there's a bill that comes to the floor for Medicare for all, I would vote for it. I mentioned that in 2018. But also in the immediate future, we should lower the eligibility age of Social Security to 55. We need to expand the children's health insurance program uh, for every ch child under the age of 18. And in the midst of COVID, we need to expand um, uh, the, the ACA and open up all the exchanges so that the 37 million people that are unemployed right now can get the care that they need. Kimberly Graham. So I'm a little confused by other Democrats who say health care is a human right and then go and talk about it the way that they do. If health care is a fundamental human right in a wealthy and moral nation, then it is a human right, period. It's not a human right if you have the money to write your check for an insurance premium or to pay a deductible or a copay. That's not what I define as a human right. A human right, you just have it. So a public option, unfortunately, I wish it were some great fix. It's not. It's like putting a Band-Aid on an infected, dirty wound. It looks great from the outside for a while, but it is not going to be sustainable. And our health care should work like it does in a lot of other wealthy, developed, capitalist countries where it works like a public library. We all decide we're going to invest in libraries, right? They're important. We all pay for them. They're not free. We have to pay the librarian, the books, the building. But when you walk into a library, you just hand them your library card and you leave with a book. You don't pay anything at that time of service and you never get a bill and you sure as heck never go bankrupt. And that is what healthcare needs to look like in the United States of America. Okay. Let's turn to a subject again from the presidential campaign raised by Andrew Yang, universal basic income. A form of that was in the first stimulus bill, uh, Teresa Greenfield, and that every American who earned less than $75,000 a year got $1,200. Is that a wise use of federal funds? In this time of COVID pandemic and economic crisis, that again, I believe will be one of the most consequential events of our lifetime, to provide direct relief to workers is absolutely a wise use of funds. It's, it's an investment in Americans. And in the plan that I put out, I focused on how we help keep our workers healthy and safe how we invest with direct payments, how we work to make sure that small businesses have the capital they need to stay open. And one other thing that I think doesn't always get talked about here is that we need paid sick leave in this country. Workers should not have to decide whether they go to work sick or whether they stay home and possibly lose a paycheck or lose their job. And so those investments in our workers are the best thing that we can be doing right now. Mike Franken, was the $1,200 payment wise? Um, I saw a wiser choice to extend unemployment benefits and be quicker in putting people on the unemployment rolls and to also expand the SNAP uh, program. We have working programs in place where we don't dawdle with those who don't necessarily need those, mo those, those funds. They're not spending those, mo those monies because they're still working. And those that did receive those funds, it's been 10 weeks, right? Consequently, $1,200 in 10 weeks, it's nothing. It doesn't do anything. You need to, this needs to be continuous. So we added, we, we, we uh, seeded a large population base with $1,200, um, and a lot of it didn't go into circulation, and those that needed it didn't get enough. 
Kimberly Graham, what are your thoughts in regards to this subject matter? Well, I, I do think that the $1,200 one-time payment was absolutely ne a necessary investment. However, I don't think that it, uh, it it's kind of pathetic crumbs to the to working people in this country. And that bill had over $500 billion in subsidies and giveaways to, again, huge multinational corporations, some of which don't even pay taxes in this country, by the way. So... Um, it should have been like other developed nations are doing around the world, um, anywhere from maybe $2,000 a month for three months upward. Other developed nations are doing more than that, actually. And I think it needs to dovetail with unemployment. I agree with Admiral Franken. You know, if somebody's getting sufficient unemployment, then perhaps they don't need the additional amount. But I think we need to take a look at that. But for most people, uh, at least a couple of thousand dollars a month for a three-month time period is at least something that's going to keep people safe, keep them home if they're able to stay home unless they're an essential worker, and also inject money into this economy, which desperately needs it right now. Eddie Morrow? You know, so this, this COVID uh, financial crisis we have right now can be a great accelerator, <clears throat> and we can go two different directions. We can accelerate downward to lower income, lower employment, lower health care, lower standard of living, or we can accelerate forward and upwards to a stronger uh, country. And again, my background in, in, in working in business and the great financial background I have lends itself well to this moment in time. I think we should, if you go back and look at our COVID um, response that we put out several weeks ago on our website, eddiemorrow.com, you'll find that we advocated for a UBI payment that goes on throughout this pandemic and that we need to make sure we have an accelerator in place so it doesn't expire. We don't want to wait for Congress to come back and then hem and haw and argue. Every, every, every person right now should get at least 12, 15, 18, maybe $2,000 every month right now. People need to have that stability. They need, they need to know when they get up in the morning, they can pay their rent, they can buy food, they can, they can uh, get the prescription medicine they need. They don't wanna wait till next month to see if, if the government's gonna step up for them. That should already be a given to be taken care of. And then you know what's great about that? Is if we do that, then we'll have an experiment about UBI. And then we can determine if Andrew Yang is right, we should extend it permanently or not. But we'll at least be able to uh, collect some data. We need to go stronger. We're not going strong enough to solve this, this crisis. I'm the strongest candidate to do so. Teresa Greenfield, let's switch gears to immigration. Should it be a crime to cross the border without documentation? Dave, our immigration system is broken, and we need to modernize it. We need to address issues like that. We need to make sure that it's humane. We need to make sure that it does keep our borders safe and that we keep families together. And certainly Iowa has a rich history of welcoming immigrants and refugees. Governor Bob Ray showed us how to do that. And our communities are very welcoming. Right now, there is a group called Iowa Compact on Immigration that is talking in a bipartisan way about how we can modernize our immigration system in a way that grows our economy, grows our jobs, keeps families together, and also keeps uh, focuses on public safety. But anything specific about this particular question of coming into the U.S. without proper... Pay the whole system is broken, Dave. Mr. Morrow, what's your thought about immigration and specifically this, uh, whether you should decriminalize illegal entry into the United States? No, thanks for asking. So in addition to being a teacher and a business owner, I spent a lifetime in community organizing. A founding member organization known as Amos has done some great work on immigration um, for over 20 years. So the, the, the first part of your answer is, is, is no, that, that's, that you shouldn't be arrested for that. It's a misdemeanor at most. But we need to talk about our immigration policy, right? We need to talk about comprehensive immigration reform. We need to make sure that what we're looking and aiming to do at our border is to keep out extremism and human traffickers. We need to make sure we're closing up those inhumane detention centers that are down there. We need to talk about reunification of families. We need to talk about reconstituting ICE. There's a lot of comprehensive work we need to do. We need to talk about climate change as well, which is impacting mass immigration across this world. And we talk about forward-thinking diplomacy again that will help people stay at home and not feel like they need to flee. Kimberly Graham, immigration. So seeking asylum um, is not a crime. You're supposed to be able to seek asylum in this country. Um, this past September, I spent five days volunteering um, at the southern border, um, volunteering my legal services to help asylum seekers. And what I saw there was that the United States, unfortunately, is violating international asylum law um, and is violating due process, which is supposed to be one of our basic foundations here of our legal system, um, not sending proper notices to people about their hearings and so on. Um, and we really need to fundamentally remake our immigration system so that people who are here, who are our DACA recipients, can be citizens immediately so they can stop living in fear of deportation. We deported a young man from Des Moines here a few years ago. He was killed in Mexico. I remember that was in the news. 
And that just shouldn't be possible. It shouldn't be possible to deport someone who was brought here as a child and doesn't even know the country that they came from. So we have a lot of remaking our laws to do. We need to get rid of the three and 10 year bans. We need to make worker visas more uh, easily available so people can work here with documentation and so on. Mike Franken. It's not a crime. Get the kids out of the cages. The wall's idiotic. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, a, another lightning round question. When Joe Biden was a U.S. senator, he helped shepherd through a bill in the U.S. Senate which banned assault-style weapons. Let's start with you, Mr. Frank. And if you're elected to the Senate, would you vote for a similar bill? I would. And I've got a lot of experience with guns, as you can expect. No one's going to gunsplain me in this, in this Senate. Teresa Greenfield? You know... I think it's long past time where we have enacted some policies to keep guns out of the hands of people who can hurt themselves and hurt others. We have got to take that action. And for me, it starts with some bipartisan action. We need to uh, ban gun show loopholes. We need to have universal background checks. And we need to invest in research uh, so that we understand why we have so much gun violence in this country and that what our next steps are going to be. Eddie Morrow. You know, somebody that owns a gun um, in respect to Second Amendment, the, the answer to that question is absolutely. We should reinstitute um, uh, the assault weapons ban in this country. It saves lives. It, it demonstrated save lives in the 10 years it was in play. It'll save lives again. Kimberly Graham. So uh, my dad is a former Marine and a Golden Eagle NRA member. He's been an NRA member for over 50 years. And I was talking to my dad about this question, and he said this, if you need an assault weapon to hunt, you have no business hunting. If you need an assault weapon for anything else, you don't need one, because what they're really good at is killing a lot of people in a short amount of time. And I'm with my dad. I think we should reinstate the assault weapon ban. I want to um, move to... The, the issue of climate change. We've talked about pieces of that, but Mr. Franken, uh, what do we do, what do Iowans do about this problem that doesn't hurt our economy? Like I'm thinking of restrictions on the cattle industry, for example. Sure, it doesn't hurt our economy now, but the flooding and the erosion and the soil deprivation, all of those things it does indeed. Ultimately, we should start local, individual. What can you do about it? And then expand internationally. Reinstitute, join, rejoin the Paris Accord, make it more strict. Iowa is going to be a net beneficiary of climate uh, addressing issues, including carbon sequestration. This will be good for Iowa. There's a whole plan to execute. And ultimately, we need to get on board and embrace this and make Iowa agriculture simpatico with climate change. Teresa Greenfield. We need to confront uh, climate change. Uh, the science is very clear. We have a man-made global climate crisis on our hands, and we need to take urgent action. Uh, Iowans know what climate change looks like. It's the flooding we've had in southwest Iowa and southeast Iowa. It's those three-inch rains that really affect our agriculture industry here. And so for me, I think we start with reducing our carbon footprint, getting back into our international accords, working towards our 2050 goals. But there's an enormous opportunity here to grow renewable energy jobs right here in Iowa. And we need to invest in that research so that we grow jobs and our leaders in renewable energy. Kimberly Graham. Well, we need to implement this resolution called the Green New Deal. Um, you know, back when we had the first New Deal, um, that produced a lot of fantastic infrastructure building, a lot of which now is crumbling, right? Because that's the last time we made major investments in our infrastructure, and we have to do that again. Only this time, we have to do it in a way that includes everyone, that makes sure to include people of color and women and all of these good new jobs, these good union jobs that we're going to be creating. We need to electrify rail. We need to bring more solar power, more wind power. Uh, we need to replace our lock and dam system on the Mississippi River. There's so many jobs that we need to do, and we can do them in a way that is also going to help the environment at the same time, including localizing our food sources here in Iowa. We are the um, third state in food imports, and if we grew more of what we ate here, that would help the climate at the same time as helping our farmers. Eddie Morrow. Yeah, so I think the, uh, the climate uh, crisis and chaos is hurting our economy. My business is, uh, is covering floods and, and hailstorms and tornadoes and winds and the severity of rain and then drought uh, with farmers has been impactful. And we need to make sure that we're turning that around and actually making a net positive for farmers. 
the climate should be, our climate solution should be about carbon sequestration and cap and trade and, and, and also um, a, a carbon free dividend. There's a lot we can be doing for farmers that would, be, that would bring uh, vitality into those areas. I've got one minute left. It's 15 seconds apiece. What have we, what have Kay and I missed here? Mr. Morrow, quickly. We haven't talked enough about rural Iowa today and, and breaking the rural and urban divide. We Lisa have a Greenfield? child care crisis in Iowa, and as someone who's a single mother and relied on it, we have got to focus on how we get more child care throughout Iowa. Mike Franken, what we've have we missed? We've got a national debt problem, and we've got Republicans who are dismissive of it. Kimberly Graham? Right, so I've been drafting the American Child Care Act, so I would echo what um, Greenfield said, and that is that we need to start working on the child care crisis, and by the way, one-third to one-half of our child care spots are vanishing during COVID-19, and a lot of them may never come back. So our crisis has now become an extra crisis on top of that. Thank you. And thank you all for answering our questions. I know we're pointed at some point, but <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It was fantastic. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. again to all of the candidates joining us at Iowa PBS studios tonight. And a quick reminder, the November 2020 elections are 168 days away, but only two weeks remain until the June 2nd primary in Iowa. For our hard-working Iowa PBS crew in Johnston, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks.